Thank you all for joining us this evening. As you know, you're on a UC San Diego campus in our structural and material engineering building for our Energy in 2020 Sustainable Solutions Program. Uh, so if you are here for our first event on October 25th, now this is an innovative collaboration between SDG&E, the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce, and the Jacobs School of Engineering. SDG&E presented the challenge to imagine a green future in San Diego. And we took this challenge in partnership with the Green Chamber to see how we might be able to imagine sustainable solutions for 2020 and beyond. And so uh, we have a very full program for you all this evening, and so we're going to get it underway. We have a, a full panel of great speakers, but very briefly, I just want to tell you about uh, one of your partners here, the Jacobs School. Uh, our vision of the Jacobs School is to provide the human capital and the intellectual capital to drive our innovation society. And our mission is to educate tomorrow's in technology leaders, conduct leading edge research and drive innovation, and transfer discoveries for the benefit of society. And our Jacobs School of Engineering is actually the largest engineering school in the state of California with over 6,000 students and nearly 200 faculty members. And you're in one of our newest buildings dedicated just this past September 2012. And we're glad to have you in here and to show you the, the great work that's going on here in the Jacobs of school and more broadly on campus. And so uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring forward uh, David Hall with the U.S. Green Chamber of Commerce, who's going to facilitate all the speakers and presentations that we have this evening. Um, he'll be in very capable hands and we're you know, glad to have you with us. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. We did it. We pulled this off with, uh, with about I don't know, two or three weeks uh, time. So I, I really uh, appreciate everybody coming here. We have some really amazing speakers and we have a lot of great information. I'm going to jump right into it because I'm really excited to hear this first presentation. Um, Chris, Kristen Hansen is a sustainability program manager for the UCSD Sustainability Resource Center. Um, and as program manager, she coordinates tracks and analyzes campus sustainability programs. Um, so happy to have her here tonight to discuss some of the center's newest in a, initiatives, including Sustainability 2.0, um, a program meant to translate key research discoveries into new possibilities and sustainable realities. And you know, I, I just want to say, it, it's amazing that right in our hometown, many of us don't realize how much is being done on our college campuses. And in, in our last, in our first event, I found out there was 8,000 engineering students. You know, that's our future. And, and what they're creating and what they're doing is, is really amazing. And I don't want to take any more time. Kristen, please come on up. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I'm happy to be here tonight and I don't have much time, so I'm just gonna introduce the video real fast and start playing. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Um, so let me get this started. And I like to joke that I just heard that Stanford now has Sustainability 3.0. So the challenge is on and we all need to step it up to Sustainability 4.0. They're not at 80%, though. <laughs> They're not. So rather than speaking about our entire sustainability program, I thought I would show you a video, a case study on our microgrid. We do have a leading energy um, system in San Diego and actually globally. We have a lot of visitors that come to hear about what we're doing for uh, energy. And the future of tomorrow is already here. So here it is. I'm James Newcomb from Rocky Mountain Institute. In Reinventing Fire, we've described a scenario for the future of the U.S. electricity system, one that relies principally on local solutions. We've come here to the University of California at San Diego to study and document one of the best of class examples of a network that provides local control, yet is integrated with and interfaces with the larger grid itself. It's this kind of change that holds the potential for transformation of the electricity system toward its future state. Energy is extremely important to UC San Diego. Uh, we are an extremely energy intensive university, uh, primarily because of all of our laboratories and our research and our hospitals. 
The microgrid is essentially a single point of connection into the utility grid, and behind that is the entire campus, our 13 million square feet and 1,200 acres. And what it provides us with is low cost, high reliable electrical service to the buildings. A microgrid controlled system basically allows an orchestration of your generation, your storage, your load or your demand for energy, your transportation, and your imports. As you can imagine, when you're doing cutting edge technology and trying to integrate it into operational systems, you're gonna have plenty of challenges. But you know, you learn through those, you go ahead and you push on through them. We really see a great future in these optimized microgrids, and especially in control and communication. Uh, once you have all, the, the, all of the data, you should be making uh, intelligent decisions basically on a minute by minute, second by second basis. The microgrid provides a level of control, provides savings to the campus, provides learning opportunities, and it also is, is highly functional in emergency situations. On September 8, 2011, there is a blackout that occurred between Arizona, Southern California, and uh, Northern Mexico. Our microgrid performed exceptionally well during that period of time. So we can shed load in the buildings, uh, we can go off our thermal energy storage tanks, we don't use electric electricity for chilling the campus, and then we ramp up our own generation to take care of 100% of our load. Renewable energy is one of our most favorite ways to approach uh, adding to the resources we have on our microgrid. But renewable energy is intermittent and variable, and so it creates a greater challenge to bring this into the mix. We are developing a cloud tracking technology that can track the clouds and uh, predict on very short time scales and at a high spatial resolution and temporal resolution um, the power distribution on the ground. That means uh, they know now uh, several minutes and up to days in advance how much sunlight we will have and uh, how much of our total energy needs can be supplied from uh, solar energy. We can be smarter about uh, scheduling power plants and also about changing our behavior um, and planning that in advance. To industry and to the government, UCSD is definitely a leader in uh, energy use, usage and uh, smart grid development with its emphasis on bringing in multiple renewable technologies into the grid and integrating them and seeing uh, what technologies work, what technologies don't work will serve to inform grids of the future. They can use us as a living laboratory to test and to optimize these technologies before they deploy them on a large scale basis. Our interest is to replicate this experience and so it is seen and found in institutions, communities, campuses, military bases around the world. Well, all of our decisions on energy projects really come down to financial and economic terms. And the, the investments we've historically made have all saved money. The microgrid has saved the campus millions of dollars over the last year, several years. And most importantly, it's provided us with the direction to save even more in the future. The response to the success of our microgrid in using renewable energy technologies has been universally embraced by our students, our faculty, our staff, and our alumni. Energy is the key industry to focus on in terms of increasing uh, global sustainability, uh, helping to reduce effects of climate change, and provide um, benefits for humanity because access to energy is is definitely correlated with quality of life. The control and operation of the electricity grid is a key enabler for using smaller distributed technologies to solve our energy problems. RMI is seeking to identify and amplify the kinds of solutions that have the potential to transform the electricity system. We hope that you'll join us in that effort. All right, so they said it better than I could ever say it. So if you have any questions, I will have to leave early, but I will leave my card. And if you have um, any questions about getting involved or asking more about our energy or other aspects of the sustainability program, my cards will be on the outside registration table. So thank you. I don't know about you, that is super impressive. Is that incredible or what? Kristen, thank you so much. Um, 
I have the great uh, pleasure of introducing um, one of our sponsors. Um, one of our sponsors was SDG&E, and one of our sponsors is right here, uh, Greg Rex, with a company called Take Shape for Life. Um, have a lot of experience with Greg. I've known him for about 10 years and uh, um, had the opportunity to um, get coached by him. Because like a lot of entrepreneurs, I tend to go all in or all out. And when, one of the times when I was all in, I jumped up to about 2.30 or so. And the clothes that I, you keep that are a little bigger didn't fit anymore. And so I called Greg and said, um, can you help me out? And then I went all in, you know, and, and uh, he helped me get back down to from 38 to 32 and keep it off. Um, it's really a coaching program, and it's a really amazing thing, and they've helped thousands of, uh, tens of thousands of individuals across the country. Uh, in addition, uh, Greg is a great business coach, and um, you might have seen the sheet on your, on, your, on your chair when you came in, but he was with uh, the Tony Robbins organization here locally and helped bring that organization from $6 million in revenue to $60 million in revenue. Um, he was a director of sales for Magellan Group and director of sales with a startup company called IPix that was one of those companies that, you know, there's like a few employees, and then like 18 months later, there's like... A thousand? How many employees? Fifteen hundred employees, and you know, going public and, and going out. So he's had a, a tremendous amount of business experience, but a good friend with an amazing product, and also very much a supporter of the Green Chamber. And and in all honesty, when we talk about sustainability, there's more to it than just environmental sustainability. And our health is so critical and important. And and Greg is one of those people that just gets it. So um, I'm going to bring him up in just a sec. Let me pull up his uh, his uh, PowerPoint here real quick. And there you go. And at the end, we're going to have a raffle. And we're going to figure out the logistics of it for timing. So we'll probably pass something out to get everybody's cards, or we'll get it as we go out to networking. But he brought some gifts for, for that. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be here. This is a big, hairy, audacious goal that people in this room have, is to save our planet and, and do something, you know, little steps that can make a meaningful impact. And I think that as it is up above, so is it below. And there's a microcosm and a macrocosm to energy and sustainability. In the, in the individual, the energy is what? Food. It's, it's your life force. It's what you bring in and it sustains us. In an organization, it's as the, uh, as the people announced tonight, it's the people and the ideas and the innovation. And these things are all interconnected. So my challenge to you tonight is to help you think about how getting some, let me ask you this question. In this picture here, when I was 50 pounds overweight, like close to where he was, David was, do you think it affected my performance in business? Did it affect my performance in relationships? In almost any area of life, if you're not at your best, optimal health, it's going to affect your performance. I'm going to talk about specifically corporate wellness. Now, I think if we talk about pollution, <laughs> if we talk about pollution, one area we don't talk about is nutritional pollution. There's a lot of unhealthy um, toxins in our environment when it comes to food. And what's happening is not rocket science. This is clearly math. Calories in and calories out is a huge factor here. In 1960, the average intake was 1,900 calories. That's about what a human being needs, man or woman, close enough. Uh, fast forward to 2009, the World Health Organization found that United States leads the world. We're number one in one category, which is calorie consumption. And following calorie consumption leads what? Obesity. We are also number one in obesity, and we also are number one in health care costs. How many of you think that if we don't do something about obesity, our health care system doesn't stand a chance, right? So one of the hairy audacious worlds we have is this environment where health food is hard to find and expensive and junk food is everywhere and the average American has a daily intake that looks like this. They wake up in the morning, they have orange juice, their blood sugar spikes, that's the blue line. As the blue line goes up, something goes into the system called what? Insulin. Insulin causes the blood sugars to go down and then you're hypoglycemic. Anyone ever had a hypoglycemic attack? How does your brain function? Not very well at all, right? So when you're going up and down like this, it wreaks havoc on the blood system, on the, in, on the endocrine system, on the hormones, and your performance is clearly affected. So let's talk about the bottom line to a corporation or an, or an organization. One of the biggest impacts financially is the diminishing profits, which are going, 50% of the average, Amer average uh, company is going towards their healthcare costs, 
compared to 7% ten de uh, three decades ago. Absenteeism is a big issue. Obese and overweight people have a higher tendency to miss work. Over 450 million workdays were experienced because of overweight. And medical expenses, it's 42% more expensive to cover an obese uh, employee as it would be for a healthy employee. So clearly it's affecting the bottom line. And these are stats from you know, Gallup and uh, CDC and American Institute of Preventive Medicine. Now we know that everyone's been trying for decades to exercise more and eat less, right? Just like I did in my before picture. But dieting doesn't work typically. 85% of people who go on a diet gain the weight back. And it's what they're trying is old techniques that just haven't been very effective. Nutritional counseling, dieting. And here's the main reason. The main reason why you can't create a, a solution is that people are starting focusing on the problem. It's the biggest reason why our healthcare system is in the dysfunction it is, is because it's not a healthcare system. It's a sick care system and it focuses on the problem and doesn't really address the cause or the issue. Would you agree with that? Mm -hmm. Healthcare system is completely reactive. So here's what happens. Somebody says, gosh darn it, I'm overweight. I had enough, I'm gonna t go on a diet. So the problem creates action. The action is they eat less and they exercise more. That action actually produces a result called what? Less problem. But with less problem, there's less tendency for future action. This is the trap that people find themselves in and they yo-yo. And the, and the pattern of it looks like success followed by relapse. Success followed by relapse. I will challenge you that in business, if you have a business that's doing this, you're not sustainable. A sustainable business has a different trajectory, a different map. So we found that problem solving is one of the reasons why dieting doesn't work. And we have uh, found actually a solution for that. What our philosophy is, I'll just give you a two minute overview of our company because that's not the purpose tonight. The purpose tonight is to get you to think about the health of your employees and the health of your company. And if you don't manage the energy, is money energy? Yes. If you don't manage your energy, your resources, you're not going to be able to pay the bills to keep the lights open. So one of the biggest things you can do is invest in the wealth, the, the health of your employees. So we talk about healthy body, healthy mind, and healthy finance. We find an integrated approach works much better when we coach somebody. And we have a simple system that has three components. One is the nutritional plan to get people to eat small, frequent meals that are lower in, in calories and lower in glycemic load so they can keep their blood sugars balanced. Number two is a lifestyle program that they can go through and change their behaviors and learn how to make better choices. And number three, it's guided by a health coach or a consultant, someone like these, who goes into the uh, employer and does workshops or does one-on-one -on -one consulting. Just to give you a couple of snapshots of people that we've worked with, we really have a transformation with people. When they embrace this lifestyle, you can help somebody really become, turn over a new leaf in their life. And whether it's a working mom who's just got kids at home and they're both so busy they don't have time to take care of themselves, it's a real gift for me to be able to do this work. So if you know anyone who's struggling, I'd love for you to uh, think of me. Uh, just to kind of close this loop, the bottom line is, Every $1 a corporation invests in employee wellness, they save 3 to $6 on the back end. This is according to the American Medical Association. So there's no better investment you can make than in yourself, your own health, in your family, and in your employees. So I want to challenge you as you go home today, one simple step that you can do is just kind of be aware. Take, take, take uh, inventory of what's in your workspace, what's in your break room. And uh, if you need help and you don't know what to do or where to start because it's a daunting task, uh, we're here to help. You know, I, I do several free lectures from time to time. I even go into corporations and I'll do a, a, a lunch program for your employees. If you personally need some coaching like David did, I'm available for that. We do a complimentary assessment to see if this is a good fit for you and if it works for your philosophy. And then we also have many uh, uh, upcoming events. And I have uh, flyers and, and brochures out at my table. If you want to ask me questions, I'd be happy to talk to you. Uh, we'll do the raffle later, as David said. Um, and I'm going to raffle off our, our, our coaching program. It's a, it's a self-study. You can take it home. You can do it at your own. And if you want my support, I'd be happy to support you as well. Um, but I will like to close with one thing is that um, how many of you have seen the adoption curve where technology goes through the early adopt innovators, the early adopters, the mainstream? This is our, our, our call to action to America, to catch the wave to a healthy America. The early adopters start the movement. Uh, the innovators, they're, they're crazy. No one even believes them until they actually can get something up and running. But then the early adopters really carry that movement to the mainstream. And once you cross that chasm to the mainstream, you start this momentum that becomes unstoppable. The movement becomes unstoppable. I wish that for you in sustainability, for, for energy, 
and for your health and your life in every aspect. So our vision is to help get America healthy, and we're trying to do it one person at a time. So we appreciate all your support, and we encourage all the work you're doing, and I support. I uh, can't wait to hear the, the uh, speakers tonight. So, David, back to you. That was incredible on many fronts, and I was talking to all of our speakers, and I'm like, we have so many great people. Everybody has to go really fast, and so I know that Greg uh, covered a lot of information, but it, it's all really important, you know, and, and as a Green Chamber, if there's ways that we can help support corporate wellness, that's every bit as much of sustainability as putting solar panels on your roof or talking about, you know, other energy issues, so um, we're big proud supporters of, of Take Shape for Life, and they are for us as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to introduce our panelists now, and, uh, and then we're going to go ahead and get started and, and jump right in. And how many people thought that that was very applicable to sustainability, by the way, mm -hmm. the, what Greg was talking about there? Thank you. Yeah, please, please see him afterwards when we do our networking. Um, so very quickly, we were able to bring some great people in. Let me, uh, let me talk about a, few, a little bit. Um, Ron Pitt on, on the end, uh, CEO of EcoDog Energy, which is an innovator in the home energy efficiency and management. You know, if we can't measure it, we can't, we can't fix it. We can't figure it out, you know. So his company has developed a web app that helps California residents realize their most practical and cost-effective energy efficiency efforts. And uh, really look forward to hearing um, Ron's story, and he brought a little presentation as well. Um, next to Ron, we, are, we have uh, Rear Admiral Len Herring, uh, Sr., who is a decorated naval officer with a unique background blending sea and shore assignments with multiple scientific degrees. Uh, Rear Admiral Herring has been recognized as a leader in sustainability for his efforts to ensure the Navy is responsible and accountable for its environmental impact. Uh, I, I just want to say um, I served with both of these two gentlemen on the E2, which is an environmental entrepreneurs um, organization, and um, Len is a huge thinker. You know, like it, it's so good when you're in the room with people that want to talk about. Let's talk about national energy, or let's talk about our water use, or let's talk about dealing with the big problems that really um, can transform our society. And, you know, it's, it's, it's an honor for me. And I'm just like, I remember when I was writing this, so I, do, can I say Len or do I say Admiral? I just, you know, I don't. I don't sir, yes, it's, sir. It's, sir. <laughs> sir. <laughs> um, just, just an incredible, um, incredible individual and, and real true sustainability leader here in our community. Um, and, uh, and David Saltman is an advocate for environmental innovation, a founding member of Clean Tech San Diego. He served as the executive director of the Surf Rider Foundation. Um, so I already, I already love him already. And uh, Dave has also served at, on President Clinton's task force that helped develop green procure procurement guidelines for the federal government. Um, we're happy to have David here with us tonight to discuss what he believes are the next steps for achieving long-term sustainability in small business and throughout the rest of the United States and, and his product and, and who he is. Um, when I was talking to the community about this, I would just say the names and they're like, oh, I know David. Oh, I, I know Len, it's, it's really great. So it's, it's an honor and, and I'm just about done. I have one more introduction and um, it's Irene Stillings who has um, agreed graciously to come on board and help us steward the U.S. Green Chamber and stepped in as our president. Um, delighted to have her. She has 40 years in the energy, in the energy field. Um, we got a chance to go out last week to our, our first time together and speak to green cities. And a good chunk of the people knew her. And, and certainly, they all knew of her. Um, it's really great. It really helps us out. And I'm, I'm really honored to have her on board. If you don't know where she most recently came from, it's the California Center for Sustainable Energy. And she was helpful, or she essentially facilitated bringing that organization from a handful of employees and no budget to, um, I think, 100 employees now and, and really a powerhouse in the state and something that California and San Diego is really proud of. So thank you so much, Irene. And with that, I'm going to step down. Thank you.
I, I'm so sorry. Um, we're going to bring Ron up, and and then we'll bring each person up individually. Okay. I apologize. No. So, I got excited. <laughs> Jumped right ahead of yourself. No. We're going to talk math. I know, I know, I know, I know. It's, uh, yeah. Um, not calculus. No, this is simple math. Yeah, this is a very, very simple math. And the, uh, the, it really doesn't get much easier than this. That's, that's an equation. Um, I've been in the energy business for a long time. And this simple concept is ignored, forgotten, and just, oh, just not known for some reason by so many people who are in this business and it, it is the single most important thing to understand. Pollution and bad things in the environment are not caused by people using electricity. They're caused by people generating electricity. Turning on a light bulb doesn't pollute the air. Generating the electricity that turns on the light bulb is what pollutes the air. So when you're talking about cause and effect, if you're trying to solve the problem, the problem is twofold here. The problem is when you generate electricity, it does bad things. That's one. But the other problem is when you turn on the light, you have to generate more electricity. <laughs> so the, the whole thing works together and you have to look at both sides of the equation. So I'm going to put some numbers on both sides of these equation. And before I do this, I want to make something perfectly clear. I'm a solar guy. Okay. I mean, my last job, I was the chief technology officer and president of the company that was the world's leading supplier of electronics to the solar business. We, if you saw people with solar panels in somebody's house in California, 90% chance our electronics was in the garage. So I am a solar advocate, having said that. That is the total amount of electricity generated by photovoltaics, solar electricity, in the United States last year. That's a good number. That's a gigawatt hour. That's a lot of electricity. That's how much we used. This, in the math biz, we call that an unbalanced equation. Uh, this, this particular unbalanced equation was the reason that I started EcoDump. Because my time in the solar business, I came to understand that you can make a bigger impact on the problem by making a measurable dent on the demand side than you're ever going to make by every number of solar panels you're ever going to put on every number of buildings. You just can't get there. So let's talk about that. Well, here's the problem, by the way. I hate this chart, but I put it up anyway. A CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, okay, and I know what some of you are saying. Oh, that's only 1,000 years, Ron. Long-term cycles. Okay, how about 800,000 years? No point in 800,000 years has the CO2 concentration in the Earth's atmosphere been over 300 parts per million. Right now, we're at 380. Depending on whose estimates you look at, take the oil company estimate, that's the lower one. <laughs> by, by 2100, we're going to be at 550. Um, I'm not a climate change scientist, but I don't know what that means, but I know we're clearly in uncharted waters. So uh, let's, let's talk about a little bit about what we do about it. A bunch of really smart guys got together a while back from around the world and said, how do we do this? The first thing they did was they said, let's make an achievable goal. 300, to, that ship has sailed. 300 parts per million ain't coming back. So they said, what can we do to try to stop it from getting over 450 by the year 2020? Um, so we're just trying to slow the growth of carbon in the air. And they came up with this multi-part plan. The interesting thing about this, if you look at this, the top half of it is all generation. The bottom half is all demand. Mm -hmm. We go back to that equation. You can't solve the problem with one side or the other. The interesting thing about demand, and this is very important, energy demand, reducing energy demand, is one thing and one thing only, and that's behavior change. It is always behavior change. Our energy consumption in the world is a byproduct, an artifact of human behavior. The only way we reduce energy consumption is through behavior change. I'll give you an example. Let's talk about a resident of our home. Real quickly, I'm going to go through the action. I'm going to put all these up here. Three top energy consumers in homes in the United States. Number three is lighting. Number two is refrigeration. Number one is heating and cooling. When we talk about energy behavior change and energy consumption, there are three components to it. It is what we buy, how we use what we buy, and how we maintain it. Here's some examples of all of that. When's the last, how many people here in the last year have pulled out the refrigerator and cleaned off the coils behind it? Dusted them off. <laughs> Not bad, that's three. 15% of the number two energy consumer in your home 
can be reduced by just keeping the coils in the back of your refrigerator clean. Did you know that an ice maker and a modern refrigerator, ice makers take 30 to 40% of the energy consumption of the entire refrigerator? Um, air conditioners are also notoriously bad for, for energy consumption, um, especially when they're not maintained properly. We have a large number of homes, not large, we're starting up, but we've got a couple hundred homes out there with our product on them. Our customers are saving between 30 and 40% energy reduction and, and energy bill reduction using our product. Of that 30 or 40% reduction, at least 30% of it, and I think maybe more, is done just through maintaining stuff. Just through saying, oh wow, that's taking more energy than it's supposed to be taking, and you go and look at it and find out, oh, yep, it needs a maintenance. So it's not like we're asking people to change their lifestyles. Behavior change can be just as simple as pulling out your refrigerator and dusting off the coils. So how do we get all this to happen? I just got two more minutes here. The way we get all this to happen is, well, how many people have heard that or something like that? Um, I hear it all the time. And it is absolutely the case. You know, it, don't, don't make it hard. So what we have to do is we have to look at people's motivations. The first one is green, the environmental motivation. We on the West Coast kid ourselves. We think that everybody thinks like us. Who knows what the number one selling vehicle in America is? Ford F-150 pickup truck. Has been for 20 years and second place isn't close. 150 million people in this country live places that don't have curbside recycling. I heard a gasp. <laughs> 150 million. I go to my, my house. I'm from Memphis. I was raised in Memphis. I go back to Memphis and stay at my brother's house. Not only do they not have curbside recycling, they don't recycle anything. I get done with the beer. I got to put the bottle on the counter and take it to the neighborhood recycling center myself because he's not going to do it. I mean, they just, we believe that everybody in America thinks like we do, and they just don't. So that motivation in and of itself is not good enough. That's a good motivation. People understand that. Okay, and money is important. So the, really where, the, where the, those two things meet is where the, the golden place is. Um, and yes, that's a person on a turtle, and that's like a dangerous thing. Um, but in any case, I'll give you an example. There are two TVs at Walmart. One has an Energy Star sticker, the other does not. If they are the same price, how many people will buy the Energy Star TV? If the Energy Star TV costs $50 more, how many people? $100 more. 30 or fewer hands. You see my point. <laughs> okay. Um, the real win is if I can tell you, you are going to reduce your energy consumption, you're going to help save the planet, and I'm going to save you 50 bucks a month. Mm -hmm. That's where we get mainstream. When you can make it cost positive, it becomes a mainstream solution, and we make big gains. We do that. Some other things we have to do. You have to make sure you minimize the lifestyle impact. You have to make sure you maximize the, the benefit, money. Um, and you got to keep score. There is a thing. This is my last thing. Um, they did a study. At MIT, we did a study that they put a clock on people, the wall in people's showers. Just a clock. Turn on the shower, clock starts running. Turn off the shower, clock stops. People reduce their shower time by 30%. Just because there's a clock. It's called the Prius effect. It actually has, the scientists have actually named it the Prius effect because it is the same effect you get when you look at your dashboard and you see how much your MPG is. You drive slower and you use less gas. Um, keeping score is incredibly important. And having people understand and getting feedback of what their actions are doing, if you want them to change their behavior, you've got to show them what their behavior is doing. Okay. So now comes the... 30 second commercial. Our product does all that stuff I just told you. <laughs> okay, our product is about giving people information. You put our product on your home, it tells you, do this, you'll save this much energy and this much money. Stop doing that, you'll save this much energy and this much money. And it does it in a very detailed way and it does it in plain English. So that's what we do at EcoDog. And I'm going to turn it back over to David. You're awesome. Thanks. We're going to hear from Rear Admiral Lynn here, and we can... Uh... Oh, leave the, leave the commercial up. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> we can... How about if we just... Uh... Oh, I know what we'll do. There you I don't go. do PowerPoint. Uh, yay. yay. <laughs> I spent half my life 
reviewing yeah. 150 slides, realized that I got nothing of it, and all I really wanted to see was the last three. <laughs> so I don't, uh, in my life, I've decided not to do PowerPoint. I want you to listen to me, not to watch the slide. I'm here because, uh, uh, one, David asked me to, uh, but two is that um, I'm here because I believe that the United States is at the precipice of what could be potentially the most difficult century um, of mankind's history. Um, and in particular, the issues on which we face and why we are all here to get today um, is exactly why that is the case. I believe that sustainability is a three-pronged approach. The triple bottom line is what sustainability is all about. Uh, but I also believe that if we don't figure out how to control our consumption and do exactly those things that you've already seen, everything from what USD is doing from health perspectives to, to eco-dog to I'm sure what David's going to talk about, the 21st century for the United States is going to be its last. That's my forecast. Okay, and I say that because if you look at the last three centuries, the last three centuries has been the development of what we consider to be the industrialized world, the America that we know, the Western world that has become the envy of the third world population. And you fast forward over the last 30 years, the progress of that world, which we have always believed to be third world, and recognize that that part of the world is developing at six times the pace that we did. And the sad part of that story, because for them it's a revolutionary opportunity, the sad part of that story is they're moving from the 17th century immediately into the 21st century with no space in between. Okay, so take a look at the resources that are required to drive a 17th century America and compare it to the 21st century America. Multiply it by six times at 400% annual growth. And you will see the cataclysmic 21st century unfolding in front of you. I've spent 30 years of my life defending this country. And no matter how hard I look, and no matter how many times I look back and see that what I have done for this country hopefully sustained its opportunity for a brighter future, I recognize that our national security is still seriously in jeopardy. And no matter what we do, or no matter what we have done, over the course of the last 10 years, we are no safer today than we were on September 10th, 2001. Sad to say, but truth is, if you think the last 10 years has removed all of the enemies and all of the issues that drove what is the instability throughout the rest of the globe, you're sadly mistaken. And if we don't figure out how to control our consumptive behavior and change the behaviors that are our society, we are doomed. We are seriously doomed. Look at the population of the Western Pacific and the rim, the Pacific Rim. Three billion people. Three billion people moving at a pace that if not controlled by the government, you've got to say, it's a good thing that China today has slowed down its economy. Because if it hadn't slowed down its economy, this cliff that we're ready to go over wouldn't be a cliff. 
I mean, a cliff. I, I, I can't even imagine. You know that guy who just jumped out of the stratosphere from 23, 23 miles up? That's what it would be like. Because we simply can't control and we don't understand and haven't truly created an environment where even our country recognizes the, re the, the necessity to control our consumptive behavior. It's the reason why I began as, a, as the regional commander in the Pacific Northwest and drove that home here when I became the regional commander of the, of the uh, southwestern region is that the government is the single largest consumer of all natural resources, but yet it had absolutely no program to control that consumption or, for that matter, be a group of individuals who could forecast and show how that resource should be better utilized and controlled. It's for that reason that I set out to do the things that I did in water consumption. I removed close to 1,000 acres of grass throughout the southwestern region, which, oh, by the way, is a desert. But yet we were watering it every day with precious water in El Centro, where if you stopped watering it for two days, the grass died. So the biggest concern from a, from a sustainability perspective was how much water could we control so that we could keep the grass alive, so that the maintenance folks could continue to cut it, yeah. only to hope and pray that we didn't have any difficulties and two days of lost water in the middle of the summer, it would all be dead. It's like that everywhere. If we change, you know, you want to talk about showers. If we change the showers in the country, the average shower in the United States is 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, ladies, I got it. I get it from my wife all the time. 10 minutes just isn't enough. But listen to this. I lived my entire life in three-minute showers. Two punches of the button. You know what? Nobody ever told me I stunk except for a few times in the Persian Gulf when it was just plain hot. <laughs> but the truth is, you can get your, your, your habit down to a point where you, a five-minute shower is more than any human being really requires. And if you could go from just 10 minutes to seven minutes, save three minutes, save three minutes a day on showers, this country would save 64,000 acre feet every day in water. Think of the second and third order effects of that consumptive behavior when you consider that one-fifth of the, of the United States' energy is produced to move potable water. One-fifth of our energy moves potable water in which two-thirds of it goes down the drain because we don't want to change the way we do, the, 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 the way we take a shower. Water's the next petroleum product for all, I, for all we know. We better figure it out. Because if you think they were going to have issues, you know, I, I, made a, I made a comparison once that the price of gold has gone from $640 to $1,700 and some odd dollars per ounce. In San Diego County, the price of water from 2000 to 2011 has gone up 20 times faster than gold. Now, you can live your entire life without an ounce of gold. You can't live three days without a glass of water. Think about it. Think about it. And there are places in the world that I've been where they haven't seen water in 20 years. My visit to Somalia is a place I hope I never in my life have to go back to. <laughs> But that's desperation in the third magnitude. But the entire African continent is in their 14th consecutive year of severe drought. Mm -hmm. Six times the population of the United States in severe drought, no food, civil unrest, and being raped of its resources by those in the Pacific Rim. 
21st century's got some pretty nasty business, and we better figure out how to get there from here. And my message is, we need to come together collectively to figure out what the bridge is from today to tomorrow. And I'm a bridge producer. So you won't, see, you won't hear me say, I'm a photovoltaic guy, I'm a, I'm, I'm a whatever. I think all of them have to come together. We have to pull all of the technology out of the, out of the, out of the lab and into the forefront. I'm sick and tired, and I, and I and literally have said this a number of times to folks who have said, you know, we're just getting, we're waiting for that technology to involve. <laughs> I, I'm tired of, of hearing it. Do you know that Hitler put the most massive, militarized, mechanized army to work in the Second World War and never had one single barrel of petroleum available to him? You know how he did that? He hydro-cracked coal. Can't use the same process today, but by golly, we've known about this process since 1939. And he produced more than a billion barrels a year and put people as far as Moscow in a train that created more than 100,000 barrels a day of consumption, all manufactured from coal. So when we have scientists who are now on the breaking edge of tinkering with the very strands that create life, and our, our technological advances are stumbling in the world of renewable energies and potential opportunities for a more secure, sustainable future, I say you get your priorities in the wrong place. You got your priorities in the wrong place. Tomorrow's future rests in our ability to become more sustainable, and every technology deserves the opportunity to be that next event. We've heard plenty of, plenty of announcements that, you know, photovoltaic, photovoltaic this, photovoltaic that. Hey, I can tell you that you're right. The old panels of yesterday will never produce as much electricity as it took to manufacture them. And they're, the argu they're great arguments. But the truth is, I've seen technology where the collector is now down to the size of a, literally a three by five card and it's producing four times the electricity of an existing panel, and it tracks the solar system itself for 14 hours of every day, and it takes less energy to produce that collector than to produce 100 collectors. Technology. We have to be able to create the bridge that allows us the opportunity to get to the next step. So that leads me to what is it that we have to do? We have to do more of these. We need to educate Americans into what the potentials for the future are. We need to become passionate about why it's important. And we need to implore, if you will, as American citizens, those who we send to Washington to make the right decisions for our future. Because in some cases, they're not making the right choices. They don't understand the bridge to tomorrow. And they're driven by different means and opportunities. And I'm here to tell you that my passion rests with my grandchildren. I have three grandchildren who I would love to leave in America with the same fortunes and opportunities that I had as a child to grow up, be successful, live in peace and harmony, and not spend an entire generation worrying about whether or not conflict is right around the corner because of our bad behaviors. And I say, you know, my generation has done a terrible job. And I believe it's time for my generation to stand up and admit so and become the ground truth 
for what that change is for tomorrow's generation. And this school and things that are happening in higher education are a perfect example because they're thinking out of the box. They're not lined with the model, and that model is going to provide them a much greater aperture for success than anything that we've done. So thanks very much for the opportunity. I look forward to your questions. Man, that is a tough act to follow, isn't it? That is impossible. You know, it's funny to have a hippie, former hippie surfer, give a plug for the Navy. But if you think about who looks 50 years forward, it's not business in this country. It's not the church, which I would love to see embrace earth stewardship as part of its agenda worldwide, no matter what denomination or religion. But it's actually the military. They're the ones who look 50 years in forward. And the Navy was responsible for the transition from wood to coal fire to nuclear to now electric and now is looking at islanding bases and, and removing the, the, the risk, let's say, of one wire in, one wire out of any place and also knows better than anyone in the world the absurdity of defending oil in, in very unstable regions of the world. So I'm the I'm the blue sky boy. I'm the guy who says, okay, so now how do, we, how do we, given what we're dealt right now, which, and I could spend a lot of time talk, lecturing you about global warming, and unfortunately or fortunately, we have the smartest guys in the world right down the street from us in, in Scripps, and they'll tell you that the only reason why their predictions in 1970 didn't come true of one degree raised already is because there's so much coal fire power happening in China that it's cooling some of the atmosphere, but it's so temporary that we're then in big trouble. So I won't get into that. I'm just going to tell you we are in big trouble, just like the Admiral said. We really are. So how do we move very quickly? In my life, I've sort of begun at that 20 years ago in nonprofit with Surfrider Foundation. And I, we won the largest Clean Water Act lawsuit in American history. And then I, re I realized you couldn't just fight lawsuits. You had to be proactive. And from there, I ran a public solar company. And we looked at building integrated solar, like this campus has done, where you could generate power. And now I'm really into advanced materials. Because my notion is that in a world where we're going to see drastic climate change and great rise of sea level in our largest population centers, we better start thinking about how we build building materials. So, you know, my father was a prof professor here, for those of you who don't know, he actually gave biochemistry uh, tests where he'd always open up a New York Times article. So, and this is, he would, of the week, and you were tested on that. This, this is Sunday Business Times, New York Times, the Mad Max economy. In other words, what opportunities are going to be presented to us by the fact that we've fucked things up really badly? And that, to me, is not just a vampire's point of view. That is, OK, what do we really have to do really quickly? Where are the key decision-making points, and where are the key things? And in my mind, I, I, I really think a lot now of advanced materials. I think that the way we build, build our environment and our buildings and our homes consume by far the vast majority of our energy, and they create most of the CO2. What, 60% of the CO2 comes out of our homes and buildings, not out of our cars? So we really have to rethink the materials. And the way I think about materials is the transition from petroleum-based chemistry, which we've been locked in for 100 years and has enabled all kinds of great things, plastics and advanced materials and paints and coatings and pharmaceuticals, as well as fuels, that we need to take bio-based materials and start to look at these. And that's what I started doing. And we started doing it for the auto industry, and now I'm doing it with these advanced foams. At Malama Composites, we take soy or we take castor oil, and we blow very high-performance structural materials that become the cores of walls. And what's the benefit? <coughs> so zero VOCs. They don't emit any toxins whatsoever. They're carbon <coughs> negative. So every pound of our foam sequesters 2.6 pounds of carbon on real equations that the U.S. Department of Agriculture does. We look at advanced materials in buildings because 
when I see those homes on Rockaway Beach and they're pulling out that pink fiberglass and every piece of drywall is now mud, we have to do better than that. And we can do better than that. And we build ships better than that. So why aren't, and we build advanced automobiles better than that. So why can't we build our homes out of composites? And the bottom line is, these are net zero homes. These are structures that don't need HVAC. They're built like refrigerators. Mass is not your friend in a hurricane or underwater. Lightweight structural materials, very efficient materials that can keep energy in. These are where I sort of see a big future. And in doing so, the billion people that don't have shelter over their homes today can be enabled to have shelter. That's a craziness. That's an absurdity. So I totally embrace everything that EcoDog is doing. We should integrate these systems right into these structures. We should integrate solar on the rooftops. We should recapture. The Admiral didn't even start to talk about the water they recapture on a ship. It's not just don't waste it, but recapture it. Madness. Throw it back in the sea? Crazy. After we've spent all that energy cleaning it up. So, so rather than take a lot of time, I think this group is such a bright group, I'd rather just open it up to questions. It's a real rangy, cool group, and then and we'll see where this goes. Much riskier in my mind. Thanks a lot. <laughs>
and that fortunately has been successful. I, I really think that this campus is a perfect model of what can be done in the region, and if you replicate what happened on this campus, you change the world. So this is a city of 53,000 people, students plus staff plus teachers, 53,000. That's a big city in America. This city is 80% uh, off the grid. Uh, this city monitors something like 40,000 data points. When you saw Washburn up there talk about it, you should see his command central. I don't know if he's here. I don't think he's here today. But just genius level command central. Um, it combines energy management with energy generation, uh, with energy efficiency, uh, LEED certified buildings, et cetera. So this place, it's about building replicable models. And, um, and I think the Admiral mentioned that as well. We, we, you, this is where the gold, the new gold is. Because there's no way to dispute it. The data's in, it's highly efficient. When the fire happened, they shipped power back to SDG&E. This campus did, with, with no appreciable effect. So the, to me, my mind is, is with a new mayor is to give them a tour of this place, say, look, this is what's possible. This is what can be done in our cities and in our communities and our homes uh, and, and look at a real integrated approach to things. Len, you were the, um, I forget, the naval mayor of uh, San Diego uh, for a time in uh, your, your naval service. What would you like to see happen? Um, I guess I would tell, tell Bob to uh, strap on his flak jacket. Because <laughs> it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, UCSD is a separate legislative <coughs> opportunity that no longer exists in California. Um, and that the regulatory process that exists in California has made it extremely difficult to bring emerging technologies to the forefront for solution. Um, in my master plan, as the Navy Regional Commander, there is a plan to build 140 megawatts of photovoltaic energy generation um, in the three bases that are San Diego. Um, utilizing basically the 400 and some odd acres of parking lot that's already disturbed, ecologically developed, undeveloped, under underdeveloped uh, properties, restricted by regulation in the power companies to limit my generation capacity to 1.5 megawatts, and that's it. Without a disconnect fee that significantly increases the cost of the electricity produced by that photovoltaic system to the point where it no longer becomes economically feasible and the government backed out of the program, but yet those systems still sit ready to be installed to create the baseline necessary to support energy independence of those Two, two facilities in particular in photovoltaic generation. If you recognize that naval bases pretty much run from 8 in the morning till 6 o'clock at night, most of the time, we have watches and other things, but those generations, the bulk of the energy is created during that time. The model's broken. Um, and I would tell Bob, if he wants to create a blue world, he better start <coughs> looking at the model. Because the model won't let you get there. If you and I, if you and I wanted to create, go off the grid, let's just say we use the fuel cell that's at CCSE currently five kilowatts. There's a new company that's coming out with a fuel cell, gas, gas uh, natural gas fuel cell, to create five kilowatts. My house doesn't use five kilowatts. So if I wanted to join my neighbor and say, I use two and a half, you use two and a half, We'll install a fuel cell, we'll go off the grid. Regulation prohibits me from doing that. There's a whelping law in California that prohibit distribution of energy from one, from one property line to another. Even if I wrote an affidavit that said, I don't give a hoot, if I ever get power from you, ever, the regulation exists in California that prohibit that type of effort. 
even to the point where if you were to develop a community tomorrow in which 100% of those homes were renewable in source, you couldn't get there from here because economically it doesn't pencil out. Got to change the model. I will uh, tell that's, you, that's, uh, uh, it is not just California. I mean, I've worked in the. leading the way because I've worked in uh, Len, worked in the utility industry for across the country. Yes. Every state, there is no state that allows no. the transmission no. of energy that's, across that's property. Well, there are there are a couple places that are off grid. And we had to, we, we passed a law in Sacramento a couple years ago as a solar company, but it was limited to HOVs. Mm -hmm. So if you have homeowners, if I say HOA, HOA. homeowners HOA. associations, HOAs, you you can do that. And the reason was you could use your common space, but the, it yeah. takes law changing. Yeah. I mean that is a mind-numbing process. But we did that. We, we passed legislation. I mean, I mean, look, simple math, okay. We, San Diego, are by far the biggest solar city in the United States, by far. In fact, if we were a country, we'd be in the top 20 solar countries in the world. Yeah. Okay, we do more here to promote and install solar power all over the county than any place else, and we now produce one percentage of our electricity from solar. You ain't gonna get there, folks. <laughs> Okay, you cannot get there with technology. So, if you want San Diego to be the aqua city, start putting city programs in place to encourage people to change their behavior. Give me a benefit on my water bill if I reduce my consumption, not just by paying for less water. Give me a benefit on my electric bill for putting in a low flush, a low volume toilet. Why the hell do we have four gallon toilets in the United States anyway? Uh, Don't, get know, uh, Don't get him started. <laughs> Don't get him no. started on that. The, the, the point is that these are things that are easy to do, but they're things that nobody's going to do unless we encourage them. And the only way you can encourage people at this point is in their wallet. So you want to make an impact? Figure out a way to make it financially beneficial for people to do things that will reduce water consumption, that will reduce energy consumption, that will cause them to use better products that are more sustainable, et cetera. And until you do that, I, you know, and I don't think, I, I, I'm a technology guy, I've been doing this for, you know, 40 years, but I don't think you can do it with technology alone. I think it takes public policy, I think it takes technology, and I think it takes a will as a society, we have to say this is important. You know, I, I like to tie into your, your wellness program as opposed to health program, too, because, you know, we spend a trillion dollars on treating disease, right? But it's so much cheaper to promote health, except a doctor can't bill for promoting health. He bill, and, and insurance companies take 9% off the top on those bills, which is a great business, let me tell you. So. It's, it, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Ron. It's about changing behaviors. It really is about switching from a, a disease uh, treating model to uh, a disease prevention and wellness model. And it really is about becoming more efficient. You know, Europeans, Kai knows this very well, Kai, you know, that Europeans, it's not like you go to Paris and you're in a bad lifestyle. You know what I'm talking about? But they use 40% less energy than we do across the board, 40%, that's not, li that's not peanuts. And so, you know- Clothes dryers in a home in Europe is something they don't do. I mean, they don't have clothes dryers in yeah. most of them. That, so, so we, there, it's, we're, I think that what we've ha what's happened in this country is we've gotten fat, figuratively, literally, and in the way we look at our resources. And that model is no longer there. And that, that is, uh, the notion of, of efficiency actually is an aesthetic, which I think we have to bring back. We used to have that as a country, by the way. We were very efficient as a country and very resourceful and very innovative. Uh, but we have to get people who, who, who really don't believe in Darwin out of the science, <laughs> off of the science board in, in this federal house, by the way. We, we have to embrace truth. 
science and fact and data that absolutely global warming is happening, absolutely it has risk. It's a, it's, we're not even sure whether it's a manageable risk anymore, but it is an absolute risk and we have to start making moves along those lines on lots of levels. And, and look, you know, again, Lynn talked about replica replicability and that's absolutely key. And here's the thing about the UCSD model, what they've done here, which is fabulous. Um, there is the issue of availability of resource. When you start talking about renewable energies like solar power and those things, it's an availability of resource issue. Do you have enough sunshine to do that? Lots of places don't. You know what? Efficiency and behavior change is a resource that's available anywhere there are people. <laughs> okay? You don't need sunshine. You don't need wind. You don't need anything other than people to be able to make those inroads. It, it doesn't even take money necessarily. But the, but the models, you know, the, the word model has been used like eight or nine times mm -hmm. just counting. And it, and it really is. I mean, it's an issue of the model. You, you know, I did a small model comparison. Um, and two of my friends are sitting in the back there, Francesco and John, who are working on a wastewater or a, a gray water system that can reduce the use of homes gray water by 40 percent. Riddled with regulation into how you can get there from here, recognizing that even when I was at USD, we had to fight the issue because they build, actually build urinal flushers that, that flush at a pint. Okay, so the, the, for the ladies, you know, you stand up and do. But you know, the, you know what the industry standard is? 1.5 to 1.6 gallons per flush. Why? Because that's the way the regulation is. That's the industry standard. Even the guys who will tell you they can save you millions of dollars will come to you and tell you that there's a pint available, but it won't be the solution. The 1.5 will, will be the answer. And you have to ask the question, why is it that there's even a four-gallon flush available on the market? When the law says 1.5. How are those companies able to put something on the market which is illegal? But yet nobody says anything. We don't enforce those. But you, have to, you also have to look at the model again, because I'm gonna, I'm, I keep going back to the model, and every time I have a conversation, it goes back to the model. I did a small model comparison, because I'm always a guy who does metrics and, and second and third order effects. But if San Diego County reduces its water consumption by 11%, Bowtie Water District goes broke. It cannot produce That's sufficient revenues mm -hmm. to be able to afford the infrastructure required to distribute water throughout the county and maintain the crew necessary to keep that water system operating. So we have done such a tremendous job in San Diego. If you take a look at the, if you take a look at our San Diego statistics. You'll see that we've actually reduced our water over the last decade by almost 20 percent. And, and an additional 11 percent conservation effort in San Diego County would break the water district. Same thing with SDG. &E. No, no, we, we actually pay, San Diego has um, very high electricity rates for the continental United States. Some of the highest. And the reason is because we are one of the most energy efficient cities in the country. Because we ship it in. The less you use, the more it costs. Because we bring it in. Because we, okay. and because and because you have to pay for the infrastructure. You pay for and 125 percent so of that, what you use. That's right. That's right. So it's it's it is the case that the model is broken, because the model right now says if we continue to reduce our energy consumption, it's going to continue to cost us more. Okay, gentlemen, I am going to interrupt you because I think we all agree the model is broke. <laughs> uh, but we have a lot of people here who have questions they want to ask. Corlin? So in the early days, a lot of people heat from Romney in regards to the quote of the $9 billion that was spent for the last four years, at least in the first two years, on green tech projects. We all know that was pretty much DOE handpicked companies almost. So, you know, so we tried, right? That was a lot of money. Everyone points to Solyndra, which if anyone knows the solar industry, they're, they're upside down to begin with, the cost of and so on and forth. But, so where do we go from here? I mean, the chances of him being able to get something passed with 
money toward, but at first I think he should, the should invest in fossil projects, not the company, that's the VC's job. But you're saying model, model, model. Where do we go from here? I mean, a lot of money was spent, and it failed, quote, unquote. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take issue with one of the things you said. Um, I do not believe at this point that, I'll, I'll give you another model that's broken, and that's the VC model. The VC model is completely broken. So to say that, well, it's VC's job to invest in companies, you're not going to get there. It is, in fact, if, you, if, the, if, if it's public policy, we decide that energy efficiency and, and green technologies are important to the survival of the country, it is absolutely government's job to invest in those companies to develop that technology. It is absolutely their job. And the problem is that you don't want to necessarily be making those decisions based on what is going to be the most profitable technology. You want to make it based on what are going to be the most effective technologies. And VCs invest in the first way, not the second. So if it is, if it is the case that we're trying to make effect here, then it is public money that's going to have the greater effect if it's properly applied. So that's, that's my only thing. So, so I, I always agree with almost everything Ron says. <laughs> <laughs> so I do agree with one statement that Romney made. And by the way, I, I held the first fundraiser for Obama before he announced his first candidacy, <laughs> just so you know. And half of the room were Republicans and half of them were Democrats who paid a lot of money to be there just to see who this guy was. So that's, that's my devotion all the way back. But uh, in terms of the notion of government betting on technologies. I think that's a very difficult thing to do. But government bets on industry sectors all the time. So we have spent a huge amount of money subsidizing oil, coal, gas in, in our lives. We, we've spent giant amounts of subsidy, by the way, investing in biotechnology. N national, you know, without the NSF and the NIH, we wouldn't have cures that today saved my life. I'm a personal recipient of that, one of those cures. So it's about looking at sectors, as Ron did say, that's strategic, and we have to make a commitment to those strategic sectors. It's not about whether Solyndra was right or wrong. I remember first seeing him at the first solar show. I thought it was brilliant technology. But when you have an entire country, China, dump solar cells on the market for below its manufacturing costs, that, that technology is not going to be around. So that's not the point. The real point is, look at renewable energy, look at energy efficiency, incentivize that, and you can build huge amounts of jobs and infrastructure in this country and achieve independence in this country because of it. And my biggest concern now is we're all going to turn our, our attention to natural gas, which is readily available, which is a great interim technology away from coal through gas to other things. But we're all going to say, oh, the problem solved. We've done it. We've, we've reduced our greenhouse effect, and I promise you, nat fracking natural gas ain't going to get us there. It's an interim step. We really need the renewables badly, and we need to bring those in. And it's only makes common sense, right? It just, it just makes sense. We have a question here. Someone? Was that well, you? I, I just want to jump in. That I think it all goes back to the difference between a disease model and a health model. Uh -huh. and until we get that straight, all the models are broken. Doctors don't make money when you're healthy. Energy companies don't make money when you don't use energy. Water companies don't make money if you don't use water. How do we change from a disease model to a health model? I agree. Model? That's right. And, and we, we look to companies like sdg and &E to be the ones, to be the leaders out there pushing for the new technology. And, you know, and people actually say, well, sdg and &E should be the ones out there innovating. It's like, well, why? Where, <laughs> I mean, where's their motivation? Again, yeah. you're absolutely right. We, we built so many of these models in the 20s and 30s, and they served our country well they did. in the development and the opportunity that existed through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. We're now at a different place in our life. There is not, there is not a major utility company in the United States that has not provided a dividend to its shareholder in 26 consecutive years. But yet there's not a major utility company in the country that does not carry billions of dollars in responsibility for deferred maintenance in a decrepit electrical grid which cost the ratepayer 
nearly 10% more per kilowatt throughout the entire country. There's not another public company in the United States that would be allowed to distribute dividends with a balance sheet that doesn't calculate to zero. But yet the utility company models are built differently because their deferred maintenance is carried on a totally separate sheet. Cost plus. Their infrastructure is carried on a totally different, different sheet. So instead of paying for and building the infrastructure necessary to support the grid that provides a 21st century opportunity, they pay it to the rate holder or to the uh, shareholder. So if you want to build the grid that's necessary to support a USD, I mean, it's the reason why STG, there are no fillers anymore. There's no microgrid opportunity in Southern California. All the infill is gone. So we're buying electricity from Arizona and Nevada, right. who's producing it at four cents a kilowatt, selling it on the market at six, and we pay 14. Yeah. And yet, as part of the stimulus package, $8.3 billion was earmarked to go to the smart grid, to energy efficiency, get our grid right, and do, and do things that are going to save energy. How much of that went to anything like a small business? None of it. $8.4 million went to utility company-backed projects. In other words, all of that deferred maintenance, we just paid for it. San Francisco, I was at a, I, I was at a Bay event in which I was asked to, to come and speak um, to some senators and some other folks from the state legislature. And it was more on Navy issues. But the, the presentation that was before me was a, an eye-opener for me. It was the three utility companies informing the legislatures and the staffers who were present of their expectation to increase rates in the Bay Area because of the deferred maintenance schedule that is so desperately yeah, needed different. to restore. I mean, the Bay Area is, it has most of its transformers were built in the 30s. And the presentation provided by these utility folks was that they actually have to go out and find firms who will manufacture transformers that no longer exist anywhere in the world at an exorbitant rate because the systems are so arcane that they have, they have to be replaced. So the briefing was actually they were going to tell the legislatures that they, were, they should expect a rate increase during the 12 to 16 time frame, of which a point I just kind of leaned back and I said, gee, I thought the ratepayers already paid a maintenance fee with every kilowatt they buy. Mm -hmm. And the senator turned around in front of me and said, what? I said, well, that's the maintenance charge for every kilowatt you buy. Why haven't they been maintaining this system since 1930? And he just looked at me and he said, good question. <laughs> But that's the model. That's the model we're living with. So we're buying 125% of what we need because physics, folks, 25% line loss yeah, we're the end is of what the line. you're experiencing. We're at the end of the line. So they love it. They love the model. We are still operating in the elect. Now, I worked for a utility for 20 some odd years as an executive. <clears throat> I understand the utility business. He's absolutely right. We're still using a model there that uh, Edison set up, uh, and it is the same business model, exactly the same. So there's a lot of work to be done there. We've only got about five more minutes. Questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, I've got a, um, an observation to make here. You mentioned physics a minute ago, which kind of triggered something in my mind. There is a technology out there right now <clears throat> that um, actually consumes spent uranium, and uh, it was developed at Oak Ridge National Laboratories in the 60s. It never got kicked yep. off because Dick Nixon funded a different alternative technology. It's called the Molten Salt Reactor, and you can look it up online. But this reactor actually, cons actually consumes spent uranium, it's green, it doesn't create any CO2. It actually takes CO2 out of the air, create liquid fuels. And uh, 
about a year ago, man, I was really kind of bummed about this. I thought my kids were going to spend their whole life fighting in the Middle East for oil. Mm-hmm. Well, this is a relief because we, we can actually, we have this technology here, and even though our nuclear regulatory commission actually is kind of scanning the way of us developing in the U.S., it's happening in China right now. They've got 50,000 engineers working on molten salt reactors, and uh, they've got, you know, $50 billion a year pumping into the program. It's basically our design for the national laboratories, and France is doing one, Russia's doing one, India's doing one, and what are we doing here? We're sitting on our hands as usual. Yep. So um, if people that want to get involved, uh, there is a group called the Firm Energy Alliance, and uh, there's a lot of physicists there, and they're old guys, and they say to me, I kind of thought <coughs> 50 years ago, funny, where the hell have you been? It's like, uh-oh, I should get on this thing. So uh, if you want to get a good mood, look, at, look into it. There's a, there's a couple at MIT right now, they're working on a reactor that does actually eat spent uranium. It takes spent uranium and consumes 98% of it, and creates enough energy to power the plant for 77 years. So don't get me started on nuke. <laughs> the Navy's operated nuclear reactors since 1959 and never had any incident. But the real issues, again, with nuclear is you say spent uranium. You know, we're still using the regulatory requirements that were established in the early 60s in the Cold War. And that a, a nuclear reactor, when we take the fuel from a nuclear reactor, it's only spent 10% of its potential. And the reason why we do that is because in 1960s, we were afraid that if we spent any further, it would be weapon-grade uranium, and therefore it would be an opportunity to create the bomb. But truth of the matter is, that uranium that's in every one of those reactors still have another 20 years of productive life before we bury it in the ground. And we, don't, we just simply, we, we need to open the aperture and recognize where the future lies. I mean, we take, we take a, a, a spent rod from a, from a nuclear reactor that has used 10% of its a, a potential opportunity, its potential, now we're talking physics, and we put in an assault bath that we maintain it at hundreds of millions of dollars a year because it's still radiating so much heat you can't do anything with it for five years until you can actually handle it, put it in a barrel, and bury it four miles beneath the surface. So why aren't we using the heat that's already in that? Why, why aren't we continuing to use it? Even if we were to use low-pressure v- uh, vessels. I mean, I operated 300-pound steam. You can do that simply. You don't need to, su- you can superheat steam at 240 degrees. It's simple. These, these reactors could do that on infinitum, but yet we bury it. We had one more question. A gentleman in the back first. Alistair McCabe, um, what is your position or posture with solar thermal, not PV, um, in that it seems to be totally underutilized in, in the energy mix um, and you know, there were more solar panels in San Diego in 1929 than there are today. Yes, I, I built nearly a gigawatt of ge- geothermal. Um, conducted the largest single survey of the southwestern United States on government property from the year 2000 to 2006. Um, I know where all eight of the major bubbles are. Um, we are, and it is part of the master plan, um, to have geothermal um, plants built in El Centro um, and Lemoore. But China Lake produces almost two-thirds of California's geothermal energy, um, and China Lake is a Navy property. But see, he um, always thinks big, so yeah, absolutely the rooftop solar thermal. Yeah, I mean, look at it this way. I mean, I, wait, how many homes but, in but Israel are the solar thermal? There's, 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 like, there's, there's a reason. Piece of, the here's way. the other piece of that, though, because this is a perfect example. Why are we putting HVAC units right. in houses? Yes. Why, is, why is the regulation for new development not that geothermal loops be developed for cooling, for heating and cooling? So, yeah, look. It, and don't tell me it Why can't not, be done. Right? State of Hawaii, in the state of Hawaii, it is currently illegal to build a residence without solar thermal on the roof. You cannot build one. And in a year from now, 
it's going to be illegal to own one. You have to retrofit the entire state. You're kidding. Okay. You know why? Because it makes sense. <laughs> because they have a problem. Because they're an island. And eventually the problem gets bad enough that the legislature acts and says, okay, we're going to have to do something about this. Um, but again, the thing about that solution is it's resource bound. It only works where, where the resource exists. However, where the resource exists, you ought to be doing it. Arizona, Nevada, the whole southwest United States ought to have similar laws. There's no reason to be building houses without solar thermal and on the roof. Anywhere, 18, right? 18 yeah. feet below the surface is, is approximately a geothermal layer that satisfies just about all of the mm -hmm. geothermal requirements for a home, for a residence. So if you were to build in that fashion, when I was at USD, we did a study, and the, at, what I attempted to do was to create a geothermal opportunity when we, we took the, they were gonna take the, the Kalachis Plaza um, from just in front of the church all the way down to the end, and at that same time, we were gonna lay about, I don't know, close to 6,000 feet of tubing and create a geothermal opportunity to heat and cool for the buildings. Um, rough, heat and cool roughly for the larger buildings. Um, that opportunity would be about uh, three and a half million dollars, um, but the total potential savings was about 17.6 million dollars over the 10 year that we would have appreciated the, prop the, uh, the project. I think, uh, Len, that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but in, in the early 90s, I was the chief marketing officer for a utility on the East Coast, and I was selling geothermal heating and cooling systems. It's unreal. And, and couldn't, but, but the problem, and a lot of the problem here, is that the, um, it's too, it was too complex and too much consumer education was needed, as Ron was talking about educating, and I think that what you all have done a superb job of setting out what are the problems that we need to solve. I would love to invite the three of you back and invite all of you back in January and let's focus on what we're going to do because I think we recognize that the problems are there. The models are broken, uh, regula regulatory procedures are broken, laws are non-existent. Uh, would you return and do this again, Absolutely. the three of you? Sure. Well, look forward to receiving an invitation from us for another uh, session in, uh, January after the holidays, where we'll let's sit and focus on what are we going to do about it. So I thank you so much. Please, a hand. I, I think this is one of the best pre, pre panels I've ever participated in. Thank you. Wow. Very That's much. A That's, a That's a lot. lot. <laughs> so one, one more second, please. One more second. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I don't want to be the, the person between you and, and, and a cocktail and some food, but I, I actually am, so I'll go really quick. Um, we're going to have the, the drawing because Greg uh, generously uh, bought, bought some gifts to raffle off. And I really just want to thank um, Catrice and Lisa with UCSD for, for helping to put this on. And to, um, and to uh, my staff that, that's here. Uh, thank you. It, if anybody here is, is not currently a member of the U.S. Green Chamber, that gentleman with the yellow tie back there, Patrick, and would love to, to chat with you. And um, we'd, love, we'd love to have you. We'd love to do more events. Um, Please see, uh, please see Greg after if you have any interest as well. And let's do that drawing real quick. Can I say to you that you come out to this uh, organization, you come what? to our events. If you want us to keep putting on more of these events, we need your support. We need you as a member. So please consider uh, joining the Green Chamber. There's lots more good stuff to come. Nathan, the long run, yeah.
Probably the most fit, the second most fit guy here. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Thank you all so much. And, and Greg, thank you so much for your support. Yeah, Nathan. Come on up. Congratulations. Right here, right here. <laughs>